What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Simply Walk the Talk. Today, we have on the show Mr. Patrick Arnold. Patrick Arnold, widely considered the father of pro-hormones, is an organic chemist known for introducing androstenedione, 1-AD, and methylhexanamine into the dietary supplement market. He also created the designer steroid THG and the Clear. THG, along with two other anabolic steroids that Patrick manufactured, best known norbelatone, were not banned at the time of their creation. They were hard to detect drugs at the heart of the Balco professional sports doping scandal, which thrust Barry Bonds and others into the spotlight. Distributed worldwide to world-class athletes in a wide variety of sports, ranging from track and field to professional baseball and football. Recently, Patrick has been innovating in the legal world of ketone supplementation, including breakthroughs in performance and taste. Patrick Arnold, welcome to the show. Welcome to Simply Walk the Talk. Our bodies and minds adapt to what we do most of the time. If you want to change your body and mind, you must change what it is you do most of the time. This podcast explores all things health, wellness, fitness, lifestyle, and biohacking. Stay tuned as we explore various thoughts, methods, and experiences from a multitude of conversations between our interesting guests and experts through many fields of work. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Simply walk the talk. Simply walk the talk. Hi, Josh. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Um, I, I am excited to have you here. And so you know, there's, there's so many things mulling through my head because I'm like, okay, we got the guy that is behind some of the, some of the biggest scandals that, that we know of in, in, in the, the sports world. But I, what I find interesting about some of the things that I want to talk about today is that when I watched the, the, the show on Netflix, the untold hall of shame story, I, when I was watching that, I never, I never considered or thought to myself, Oh, these people are terrible. This is bad. I was kind of like, I don't see what the big deal is. You know, I really didn't understand what the big deal was. I mean, obviously, I understand the legal ramifications, the things that they consider to be legal, but I was always perplexed. And I and I think this is a really good opportunity to bring someone who was at the forefront of all of this to to come onto the show to talk about the ins and outs, the things that may be considered beneficial and the things that may be detrimental to the body. And then, you know, we can kind of sift our way through all the bullshit, basically. <laughs> so um, I, I would love to, to, to speak with you about your background, just to kind of lay the groundwork so people understand just how, how good you are and what you do so that they can then understand, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's been doing his thing. Let's talk about your background. How did you get started in, in all the things that you do today? I went to college and I majored in chemistry. Actually, first tried to major in pharmacy and then I went to chemistry and I stuck with it. And I, all, all during that time and growing up, I was very much into fitness, very much into dieting and supplementation. And when I graduated from college, I went to work in the industry, chemical industry, in a small place in or relatively large place, actually, in New Jersey, where I did some boring work, working with hair care, cosmetic polymers. And during that time, I kind of ventured off on my own. There was a chemistry library there. And I did a lot of research looking into supplements, drugs, and all kinds of stuff that I was felt like doing because I was very bored at my job and wasn't very busy. So then I started experimenting with things, and I didn't last there too long. I went out, I went back to graduate school, get my PhD. And at that time, the internet was burgeoning. And I met a lot of people on there that were interested in drugs, interested in uh, any kind of interventions that could, uh, could give, you a, uh, give you an edge in athletics or in bodybuilding. And I kind of got in with a group of people that were on the, for, on the vanguard of research and writing in muscle magazines. One of them was Dan Duchesne. He got me in with a company called EAS and I was their director of research, I guess for about two weeks. And then I left there 
<laughs> and I decided that I would try to go into business myself. And I hooked up with someone in Illinois and I started taking some of my ideas and making them into actual products and their actual chemical syntheses and production. And the rest is history, I guess. So that would have been the mid nineties. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So yeah, it's, it, it's interesting because there, there's a lot of things that could be considered because, I mean, I think we do have to stipulate the difference between professional athletes, people who are who are subject to certain doping entities. Right. And then the everyday average pe person. I assume that when you started, you were looking more into that sort of professional world. Right. I, I was always looking into making a name for myself in the nutritional supplement world, which really had nothing to do with professional athletes or their obligations to a sporting body as far as uh, having to undergo doping tests and, and things like that. It wasn't really much of an interest to me until it came clear to me that there was, there was a, a crossover, a convergence of what I was doing and what a lot of athletes that were looking to get uh, an edge on their competition and that were actually under, uh, subject to urinalysis and doping testing. And that's when I met some people who really wanted to know if I could help them out, help basically help them cheat on drug tests. And, and I, I sort of had already figured out, well, I already had figured out that I knew how to do that. I just never pulled the trigger on it. And then I did. And then I, uh, the whole, uh, everything you call Balco and, and other things related to that kind of went down. And that was not, that was a side thing for me, but it did get me in trouble and it made a name for me, I, I guess. Because, you, you know, when, when I watched the, the Netflix documentary, I, I recall that there was a point in which I guess um, under the guise of nutritional supplements, ZMA was created, right? And were you involved in that or was that something? No, I don't think that. No, I was a Victor Conti. It's... Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because, okay, at some point you, you started off in the nutritional supplement space. You wanted to help people find an edge, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that, right? Especially if you're not subject to, to doping and urine analysis and things like that. And so you go through your stint and maybe we can touch on that a, a little bit more later in this discussion, but you went through your stint of quote unquote being in trouble based on all of the, the Balco stuff. Where was, what was your shift after all of that, right? Like what, what, it, what happened after all of that? And what was some of the main lessons you learned like dealing through all of that? What was my shift after the whole Balco incident had come and gone in yeah. my life? Yeah. I went back to yeah. doing what I have always done, which is develop uh, nutritional ingredients and nutritional products and developing processes to make specific ingredients, which I discovered. I went back to doing that and I came up with more products, ideas. You have to remember that the whole Balco thing, that was not what I did for a living. That was just something I did actually mm -hmm. on the side, away from all the prying eyes of my business partner and, and the other people that worked for my company. They didn't even know I was doing that stuff. So it wasn't, it, although it, it plays a, mark, a big role in who I am and what people know me for, it was not, it was not much of what I was doing. It was not a big part of my life and my career at the time. Got it. So I just went on Got to it. develop so, more nutritional supplement products and ideas and and right now I'm kind of in a in a, in a little hiatus. I'm, I'm still trying to uh, do do this that kind of thing uh, on a more of a consultant basis at this point. This point. Got it. So then, where does the the research into ketones? Where does that come in in your story? Well, it was around 2011, and I got a message from a uh, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino at the University of South Florida who I had seen on the internet, just various message boards, that kind of thing. And he knew I was a chemist and he asked me if I could make him a product, uh, something that was known as a ketone ester. And it was a precursor 
to ketones, a synthetic precursor to ketones that he wanted to do research on specifically for the Department of Defense um, for oxygen toxicity in divers. So I went to work on that. I ended up successfully making this ketone ester for him. He ended up doing research on it and found out that it was very effective in preventing oxygen toxicity. And he also went on to find it was very effective in, in uh, reducing uh, the spread of metastatic cancer, uh, spe specifically glioblastomas. And he, there was subsequent research on metabolic disorders, uh, a whole range of things that attributed to ketones that he used the ketone ester on. And I also developed P BHB salts for him, which became a whole market segment of, ex of known as exogenous ketones that people could take and get undergo a short-term ketosis by drinking a, a product that contained these BHB salts. So it's sort of a natural or legal alternative to the ketone ester, which was a synthetic product. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of confusion or maybe misinformation in the world of ketones which is why I was I wanted to to definitely bring this up with you because uh, I've had Frank Yoso on my podcast. I've had a few other guys that develop another uh, ketone product, and I feel like in the world of ketones, there's there's these these internal battles of like ours is better because it's got this, and ours is better because it's got that, and then people think that like you take ketones, you're going to lose a lot of weight. Can you kind of help me to uncover some of the like the, the real benefits of what various ketone supplements are. And also maybe in your experience, what, what do you think is the most effective for performance enhance, enhancement? Well, you have to understand the difference between nutritional ketosis brought upon by a change in diet, basically undergoing the key, ketogenic diet, which is high in fat, moderate in protein, and um, very, very low in carbohydrates. When you have a diet like that, or alternatively, if you're starving, your body produces ketone bodies. As a result of, of uh, the complete catabolism or complete metabolism of fats in the body to the point where they, you uh, end up with these uh, substrates known as ketones. And your body is, has abilities to burn those for fuel in the mitochondria. Now, when you take an exogenous ketone like the ketone ester or these BHB salts, or let's say even MCTs, medium, medium chain triglycerides, they will convert to ketones in your liver. Your body does not undergo the same biochemical biological changes it, it does when you're, when you enter into nutritional ketosis and you have a, a transient rise in blood ketone levels. And they're, they're two completely different things. And the first one, when your body's burning up all the fat it can and turning them into ketones, you're in a state, you're in a physiological state where you're burning a lot of fat because that's what you're doing. You're breaking down the fat into ketones. Now, when you take an exogenous ketone, let's say you take a BHB salt, beta hydroxybutyrate is BHB. That's one of the ketone, one of the two major ketone bodies in, in that you you make. So you take that and your ketone levels will go up to a certain extent. Your body will use those for fuel, the brain especially, and your heart are very good uh, organs that utilize ketones. However, you're not going to be burning any fat because, in fact, you may even burn less fat for, at least for that period of time because you're providing yourself with a source of calories and your body doesn't say, okay, well, now I have to make my own calories. So that's one of the first things that went wrong with the whole uh, exogenous ketone market is that people started marketing these for fat burning, which has totally got it all backwards. But mm. And as much as I tried to explain that to people, I don't think they cared because they just wanted to sell stuff. So they, didn't, they wanted to believe what they wanted to believe. Now, these product, I promoted these products for exercise performance and for mental acuity and just for effects that ketones have above and beyond uh, their immediate effects. They have uh, effects on gene expression, which is beyond, beyond your the scope of this interview. However, 
they didn't turn out to be so such a groundbreaking or earth shattering technology. And I've sort of got drifted away from that industry for many years now. I, I, I suppose the stuff is still being sold. I don't know what claims are being made, but the whole field of exhaustion ketones does have a lot of promise, mostly for medical applications. But as far as performance enhancement uh, for weight loss, I don't think is too much there. I'm glad you pointed that out because I, I guess I was maybe savvy enough or I had enough support in which I understood that it, it that it should not be considered something as a, a like a weight loss supplement. But I did find a lot of research. I, I read the, the book ketones, the fourth fuel. And, um, and again, I had some some interviews in there. And so I did understand this ability to utilize it at, as a fuel. And so I did some kind of personal end of one studies to see if it did make an effect in, in boosting my energy levels and whether it was placebo or not, I do every time I use it, maybe it's because it's the taste, it tastes terrible. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe it's, it's simply that, but I do notice a little bit more endurance. Um, I do also Inter, I do intermittent fasting pretty much daily. And so maybe that has something to do with it. So, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that I wouldn't consider it to be non-effective generally, but maybe we should be shifting our thought process and how we utilize it. And then because it is expensive and it doesn't taste great. Right. And so maybe that's where you come in. I mean, I know that I think in our, in the intro, I mentioned that you are working with ways to maybe make it taste better and maybe make it more effective. But what, what do you have to say in terms of that? Like, is there a specific protocol or formula that you like based on performance? Honestly, I haven't done any work in the, this whole the exogenous ketone industry for many years, several years now. I, I did okay. develop some okay. products. And I developed a buffer BHB and I had a patent for that. And it never really took off. And uh, then I kind of got out of it. But I would say that a lot of people had success using the BHB salts for overcoming what's known as the keto flu. And that's something that happens when you first go on a, or commence a ketogenic diet. You have a certain period where your body is, is uh, learning how to use ketones. It's learning how to make ketones in the liver. And your cells are learning how to process them for fuel. And during that time, it, a lot of people just are really irritable. Their brain is not functioning very well. They haven't made the transition from glucose to ketones. And they, these BHB salts can help them sort of transition during that, during that period. Uh, okay. That's probably one, one of the most popular or one of the most effective ways of using these products. Okay, got it. Yeah, so that that makes sense. I mean, maybe maybe people that are listening to this, maybe that allows them to, you know, to either decide one way or the other to get off the fence on, you know, is this going to be something? Because let's keep in mind, and I'm I'm sure you know this, but uh, I certainly know it. Like this, this stuff is expensive, and if it's not garnishing the type of effects or benefits we hope to gain from it, then essentially we're, we're pissing out our money. And I don't think anyone wants to do that. So um, maybe, and hopefully this allows people to kind of find some other alternatives, but it sounds like one of the best ways to, to talk about or to learn about ketones is to do it endogenously, right? To, to, to maybe work on allowing the body to produce it naturally. That's what it sounds like. Ketogenic diet is very popular. And I don't think that you, I don't think you necessarily can go out and take these ketone supplements and get a whole lot from it unless you're also embark upon a ketogenic diet and, and embrace the whole lifestyle. That's what I've determined yeah. after years of being okay. selling this stuff. Right. Okay. Um, so I have a few things listed here because I, I'm getting, I, I, I know your background is extensive and we could talk you know, in the weeds about lots of different things. But the fact that you're widely known as 
as uh, you know, the, the father of pro hormones. Um, let's, let's, can we touch on a little bit of that? Because I know that there are some great uses for pro hormones and, and some of the things that you developed, where are you now being that like, this is kind of where you started. I mean, I know you mentioned that you were in the nutritional supplement space. I also have a lot of experience in the nutritional supplement space. <laughs> I've worked uh, for many years. I worked at GNC and that's when I learned a lot about, I mean, whether it was uh, valid or not. I mean, I did learn that lots of people are interested in finding ways to, to get an edge. And I think that's what ultimately, ultimately led us to the, the Balco scandal and all that kind of stuff. Right. So <clears throat> let's talk about pro hormones. How can, or what, what is the, your sort of ultimate guide in terms of pro hormones or like, how could you explain this to the people who may not have any idea of what I'm talking about when I say pro hormones? Well, it's important for me to bring up the point that there is no pro hormone industry anymore. They were pretty much outlawed years ago. Now, the pro hormone industry started in the late 90s. I started when I brought to the market a product called Androstenedione, which is a precursor to testosterone. That was sold. People took it in to get a transient increase in their testosterone levels. It was not particularly effective. It did raise estrogen at, at the same time. But then there were second and third generation pro hormones after that. There was a 4AD and then there was a product called 1AD, which, which really sort of took it to the next level because that had uh, it gave results comparable to some steroid, actual steroid type products. In 2005, most of these pro hormones were made illegal. It's controlled substances. Some still went on to be sold for years after that. Then a whole there was another uh, bill passed that made the rest of them illegal. And now, and then there were some straggling things that ha hung on. People kept trying to push the envelope, but it was by the 2011 or so the, the industry was dead. But a lot of people did. It was sort of their introduction to steroid type products, and a lot of people did get very impressive gains, especially with the 1AD and that, those type of products. People would gain 10, 20 pounds in an eight week cycle, and their weights would go up significantly. And that's that. I mean, it's, <laughs> stuff's not around okay. anymore. So, what am I going to say? You know, I'm not going to tell you how to use them when you can't get them. So, it's, it's, it's a history. Well, I guess, I guess. The, 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 the question comes to mind then, maybe two questions. Why? Why was it, uh, why is it not around anymore? I mean, I know the, the, there's the, the legal talk, the legal jar jargon, but do you agree with it? Do you think that it was vilified incorrectly? Or do you think that, it, that, that our government or the FDA or whatever, do you think that they, they got rid of it for good reason? Well, you have to go back and say, why were anabolic steroids made controlled substances in 1989? And the reason for that, there's several reasons. I mean, it's been speculated upon. A lot of it had to do with these Olympics in Seoul, Korea, with Ben Johnson losing the 100-meter uh, the sprint to Carl Lewis. I don't remember that. It, it really brought out the abuse of steroids to the forefront for many uh, uh, fans, uh, Olympic fans throughout, throughout the world. Also there, at that point, the black market for anabolic stairs was growing quite significantly. Gyms had a lot of people that were using them. And there were a lot of, a lot of stories going around that these were killing people. Lyle Alzado got sick. I don't think it was from the steroids, but he blamed it on that. So, there was just so much negative uh, press out there, and there was there were so many uh, unsubstantiated beliefs regarding them, and they're evil to society, they're evil to medicine, so they were made controlled. And at that point, they were controlled, and I came up with the whole pro-hormone stuff, which is sort of, one might look at that as a loophole around the scheduling 
of anabolic steroids. And they were sort of like steroids light or steroid precursors that kind of acted like steroids. So from the get-go, I think the government, the FDA and the DEA for sure, wanted to make these controlled substances. But it wasn't so straightforward given the regulatory uh, hurdles that would have to be administrative hurdles that would have to be overcome. And, it, and eventually they were ended up being it ended up having to be a bill passed in Congress to schedule these. And that happened twice, like I said, once in 2005 and once around 2009 or something like that. So that, that I don't, I think from the inception of pearl hormones, I knew that they weren't going to be sticking around forever because I knew that there were people in government that they, like, wait a minute, they're just, it's just a way to get around the scheduling of anabolic steroids. It's like when people would make designer drugs like designer stimulants or designer uh can cannabinoids you know if you know about all that stuff they they always ended up being scheduled if, if they're well if they do what they're marketed to to do yeah well that that's what i was gonna lead into which is everything you described reminds me a lot of what has happened with cannabis what or, or C, you know CBD cannabis, um, lots of like even even mushrooms, right? Like I'm a I'm a huge proponent of plant medicines in a very natural way, and I see the same thing happening not only with the plant medicines, but also even peptides now, right? Like it's like what the hell is going on with all the peptide stuff, right? Because like I've been a huge fan of of BPC one five seven and. Um, you know, there, there's a, a whole host of it. And, and when you break it down, at least my understanding is, is that this is just a, a, a certain configuration of amino acids that our body makes naturally anyway. So why the hell are, are the, you know, these entities trying to schedule them or to ban them all, all together? And obviously, I think a part of that is because the big pharma wants to, to make money off of it, right? Um, but what what is your experience with with maybe you can touch on plant medicines or you can talk about peptides or both? But what is your experience in in those worlds? Well, you just you just threw open a big umbrella and covered a whole lot of stuff, all um, each of which are uh, have their unique stories behind them. As far as marijuana goes, marijuana should never have been sketch, uh, made Schedule One uh, in the during the Nixon era, and it was stuck there in Schedule One. No research could be done on it. If federally, it was just illegal to to possess or to sell for any purposes. And eventually, obviously, states started legalizing it. And it's sort of it's sort of come the opposite direction from a lot of other things. And that it started off as legal as possible, and now it's becoming more and more legal, more more and more accepted. Now, as far as uh, psychedelics go, mushrooms or MDMA, you know, whether whether they be plant based or, or synthetic based, those are either have been Schedule One or they were emergency scheduled, uh, like MDMA and things like that. They were made emergency scheduled back in the eighties. They're gaining a lot of favor for in pharma, pharmaceutical research for PTSD, depression, uh, even some diseases like epilepsy or, or migraine headaches. I know that psilocybin has some applications there. So they're heading in the right direction with that stuff. I don't know if it ever be legal, legal like that, like marijuana, but, and then you brought up peptides. Um, it's very uh, important to understand that these peptides, they aren't dietary amino acids or proteins, okay? It's, they are a configure a chains of amino acids. Uh, some of them are naturally occurring. Some of them are synthetically derived chains and they have certain pharmacological activities in the body. They are not uh, dietary proteins. They don't get broken down and then built back up into muscle or into, into uh, anything that's proteins are made, uh, comprise in the body. So 
it's people are think you know, people are mistaken when they think that oh this is just this is just a form of amino acids and therefore that why are they illegal? They're completely safe because they are amino acids. Well, there's a lot of things called endotoxins that are peptides and they'll kill you. Right. So just because it's made of amino acids doesn't mean that when it's put together, it could do it could just be a source of protein or it could be a signaling molecule that does positive things for your cells. It could boost your immune system. It can be anti-inflammatory. It could even promote the regeneration of skeletal muscles, that kind of thing, or it could kill you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And I don't know where it's going to tell you the truth. I think the FDA is sort of a, get their hands in the air because there's no particular class of these belong in that they can say, okay, well, these got to have to be illegal because well, they aren't steroids, right? And they aren't like psychedelic drugs or anything like that. But they, they are uh, active pharmaceuticals and they are being sold. I mean, some of them are being sold uh, to compounding pharmacies and there's certain laws there that are kind of uh, in a state of flux, but they're also being sold on research, so-called research chemical sites, where people can reconstitute these and, and then inject them themselves, and that's very much a gray area. So I, uh, mm. I don't take any legal stance. I'm very, I try to be, you know, a illegal. You know, just don't. But I, I do understand the legal situation. Very interested in the compounds for what they are, what they can do, what their benefits are. But I also am realistic and, and understand that that they're serious. They can be very serious compounds. They're, they're drugs. Drugs can have uh, beneficial effects. They can have deleterious effects. That has to be remembered. Yeah, per, like piggybacking on what you just mentioned. There's right now as we speak, there are hundreds of lawsuits against various companies that uh, promoted or prescribed Ozempic, right? Or the, what is it, a semaglutide, right? And that, when I started to kind of read some of these, the, some of the things that are happening, that's when, to your point, I'm thinking, oh crap, like, okay, people really are getting like fucked up. So there's, I, I saw some reports. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I saw some, um, like reports about people like forever changing their gut to where they will never have a solid crap. You know, I've seen, you know, and maybe a lot of this is uh, sensationalized a little bit, but I mean, people have really messed themselves up. And I think there's a little bit of a greed component. Maybe it's, maybe it was supposed to be designed for people who are morbidly obese and really do need it. And, and who knows some of these people who had some, uh, some detrimental effects, but I, I do like the fact that you point out that it's not just an amino acid chain. It's, it is a drug, right? It is a pharmaceutical. It is something that, that if you aren't careful can really mess you up. And I think people should hear that. So I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. There's a lot of peptides yeah. being sold right now. Some of them are pretty benign. Some of them like BPC, I, I've never heard any real negative effects from that. I've heard people say that their aches and pains go away and they, they, they recover. Some injuries that have been chronic tend to re, uh, alleviate to some extent. And then there are some things where certainly these GLP-1 agonists are profoundly beneficial medicines when used correctly, but they can also be very dangerous. People hurt themselves. Like you said, sometimes their guts just completely shut down and they stop, everything stops moving and sometimes they need some surgery. And and the the um, ozempics the and the terzepatides they, they, they these things are also being sold direct to consumer on some of these less less than scrupulous websites and with no doctor supervision and I think that's that's very scary because it's so easy to overdose these things and to be very and to not proceed with the utmost caution to, to escalate your dose very slowly and some people are like oh it's great. I'll just inject twice as much next week. Well, no way. <laughs> Cause it's, it's like a once a week in, <laughs> injection. So you really don't, you have to be very careful of, about how you plan your, your administration of it. Yeah. Well, it, I can't help but be somewhat skeptical. I mean, so obviously 
everything you're saying is is correct and and people should take heed however with the way that our society is today with a lot of misinformation out there i when i see a lot of these reports coming out on the back end of hearing that the the fda wants to regulate these things it makes me kind of go hmm all right so now these stories are coming out and so is it is it the chicken and the egg situation here Obviously, yes, there should be regulations. I think there should be some kind of regulations with 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 all these things we're talking about. But the, and there's going to always be bad players. There's going to always be people who go, well, if if one injection worked, then ten injections might work better, right, or faster, or whatever. So it, it is tricky. I mean, I don't think either of us or any of us are going to have the answers. I guess all we can do is sit back and kind of wait and watch, but we can be more aware of best practices. And um, that kind of leads me to another question in the fact that like, so you're mostly now a consultant. Are you taking on, do you take on clients? Are you working with any entities right now? How, how is, how does your work look today? Well, I'm developing some products. I, I, a couple of them might come out along with my uh, ex-business partner. I, I also, I am going to be renting a lab here in Connecticut and I'll be doing some custom synthesis work, which means people that want me to work on a, a making a, a compound, chemical compound for them, I'll, I'll do that. I, I can also do some testing. So I can uh, try to uh, do formulation work. I could try to take existing ingredients and put them in along with other so-called excipients uh, to see if I can increase their bioavailability, that, that kind of thing. So I, I will be working privately and as a consultant in, in on those uh, levels. So. Okay. Now that's really, really good to know because yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're in Connecticut, so you're not far from from New York, where I'm based. And you know, who knows? I, I know. Um, th well, we were connected through the the folks at Transcriptions, and so I know they're doing a lot of cool stuff too. And um, you know, who knows? We might be all getting together at some point. It would be nice to 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 pick your brain off the record a, just a little bit more, because like as a I'm a very curious person, and because of that because I have the ability to work with people like yourself and, and, you know, high profile clients here and there, I'm exposed to a lot more than say the average person. And so I end up becoming this, this sort of walking guinea pig biohacker, whatever you want to call it. And then what I gain from that people are interested. And so it would be nice to kind of, to kind of flesh out some of the, the, the products that are B, BS and maybe look into more of the products that are good. And if you're coming out with some products, I'm definitely interested, <laughs> um, you know, uh, because I'm always looking to push the boundaries of performance. I, uh, we call it health optimization. You can call it biohacking. You can call it whatever. But I don't think it's wrong to want to find ways to improve, especially with the, the lowest risk. And so with that, are there, are you able to speak about some of the products that you're coming out with, or in your experience up to date, what are some of the best products that you feel like give the most bang for the buck with the least amount of risk? Well, personally, I, uh, there's some few products that I find to be particularly exciting recent, uh, in the recent years. One of them is called uh, Epicatechin and it's from uh, Coco. It seems to have a lot of effects on, on, uh, the maintenance of blood flow uh, affects something called um, vasoactive endothelial growth factor, which is important for the growth and maintenance of blood vessels. It also inhibits a hormone or a signaling hormone, a cytokine called the myostatin, which is which your body makes to limit muscle growth. And by inhibiting that, it allows for more more muscle growth, more regeneration. It in addition to that, epicatechin also it it also switches your body's substrate preference to 
fat burning as opposed to carbohydrate burning. And it's been shown to do that actually taken before meals, you will burn more fat right after your meal than carbohydrate, which is sort of the opposite of what your body wants to do. So that's very exciting stuff. And the mm. other stuff I am interested in is like the NAD precursors, like nicotinamide mononucleotide and nicotinamide riboside. And I'm at an NR because they have, uh, they're ubiquitous in the body. They're coenzymes involved in, in energy production. They also regulate sirtuins, which are enzymes which help repair DNA, which helps prevent cancer because DNA disruption, DNA damage leads to uh, expression of onco gene products and tumors. So, yeah, the the NMN, NR, and NAD conversation has always been a little um, confusing for me. Um, but lately I've started to understand it a little bit more. And I was, I was actually pleased to know that in order to improve these, these certain pathways, a person doesn't necessarily have to go and get uh, an NAD in uh, like infusion or IV because this, this is what a lot of people were, were, were claiming that you have to do is the best way to do it. And, you know, you got to spend a lot of time, a lot of money, and it's not the most pleasurable experience. Right. But then there's been more coming out about the precursors being as effective, if not more effective. And uh, that's when I started to, to get interested in it. Um, and then when you were speaking about the, how did you pronounce the cocoa derivative? Epicatechin? Epicatechin? Yeah, that 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 sounds. It sounds like uh, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it it reminds me of this product called Grains of Paradise. Are you familiar with Grains of Paradise? No. Yeah, it's 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 a product that I use when I'm like when I'm seasoning my my food when I cook because it, it apparently has some of the same things you talked about with with the epicatechin and. Um, and, and the fact that you mentioned it comes from cocoa, is it a, can you buy this as a supplement now? Like a, like a, like a synthetic derived supplement? It's extracted from, uh, actually it's extracted from Camellia senescence, which is a green tea. It's also extracted from uh, something else. It is found in abundance in cocoa, but commercially they extract it from these other th things I just mentioned. There, and it can be put into capsules, or it can be put into a a, a powder formulation for a drink mix. It's, it's there. There are epi, epicatechin okay. supplements available on the market right now. Yes. Okay. And and one of the products I want to come up with, is, we'll have that as an ingredient in it. So, uh, along with other things, and I could give you the name of the company that would be sold under. When you know you, you will put it in your please do end or something I don't know yeah yeah maybe if you can let let us know we can put it into the show notes right now we've got uh, Gordon has pulled up if you're watching Gordon has pulled up the uh, a quick little Google search and um, he's got a few of these up there did you do you, you see any that that stand out Patrick I see the Coke go Coke go Cat Coke what is the yeah yeah oh. I think that first one. Should I say epicatechin? I think I, I I might have bought that stuff. Is that from my new yeah. neurotropic yeah, steep ep Epicatechin. Yeah, that's that's good stuff right there. Yeah, it, it has a epicatechin ninety percent. Good. Yeah, I'll be a one to, where to start. I think. Okay. 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 Yeah. Well, that that's interesting. I mean, I I maybe I'll look into that because who doesn't want to to burn a bit more fat, utilize fat? Um, obviously, there's a lot of those things you can do with with a proper diet and, you know, proper exercise routine. Of course, that's what I, that's my uh, field of expertise, but um, why not have a little bit of a boost, right? A little bit of a performance enhancing, especially if you're not a professional athlete and you're not subject to some of these things, because again, like I work with like rock musicians and, and models and, and actors and, and, and also just your everyday average client, 
but there's been so many people coming to me now for like in the longevity space. And so again, there's all of these, these protocols that we can do, get good sleep, eat proper food, practice some form of intermittent fasting, get some good strength training in, get some good breath work in. All these things are kind of the standards, but then eventually I like to be able to introduce blah, right? And so um, I'll be interested to see what you come out with. And when you come out with, do you have a timeline? Somewhere in the next three, two or three months, like probably coming out with a couple. Well, there's one product that we used to sell, stop selling. I'm going to be producing the raw material for that again. And plus this new product, subordinate next two or three months. And I'll, I'll give you the, it's called two. Prototype Nutrition. It's the uh, brand, the website's direct sale. It'll be sold under that, on that website. Prototype nutrition.com, right? Okay, so we can we can link to that. Um, sounds very interesting. I, I like the uh, the mystique, the mysteriousness behind it. So I've just pulled it up, and I think Gordon <clears throat> will will probably add this to the show notes. But I'll definitely keep this tab open, and I'll look through it. And um, it would be nice to to sort of be a guinea pig on on some of these things that you're doing. <laughs> because why not right you're here in Connecticut right here in Connecticut yeah um okay so as we start to wrap up like I want to make sure that that we get through everything that maybe you wanted to talk about I me mean, I know thank you for bringing up your 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 company and the the products you're going to be coming out with it looks amazing the marketing looks great well done I saw that there was DHEA on there we didn't get a chance to talk much about that but um, but you know, again, we can, we can maybe do another one in the future, or if we meet in person, maybe we can, uh, cause I know the guys from transcription is going to be out here in February and, uh, maybe we could have a little powwow or something, but, um, is there anything else that is on the top of your brain for products that you are, that you are looking into or that you're excited with, or that you can talk about that is coming out even beyond these, these first few? Well, one of the things I'm really working on now quite a bit is taking ingredients that look really great on paper, but never really panned out in the real world because they just suffer from low bioavailability, which basically means that they just are not efficiently absorbed in the, uh, in the gut or they are just so quickly metabolized and inactivated in the body that although they they may show tremendous potential in like Petri dishes or when injected into rats, they don't really pan out when people take them as oral supplements. Now I'm taking several different approaches to try to, to uh, do two things. One, increase their dispersibility, water solubility, so that when you take them, they actually can break down, go into solution in your gastric juices, and that enables them to interact with your the lining of your intestine so they have a chance to be absorbed. And second of all, they increasing their, their ability to passively diffuse through the intestinal lining. I'm actually trying to make it be less technical here, but, but I have to be a little bit for you to understand exactly what I'm talking about. I'm using different approaches. And there's a third one, and that is to prevent its, its initial deactivation when it passes through the intestine and into the liver. But if, but, I think there's a lot of things out there that people say, well, this stuff doesn't do anything. It sucks, but it really can do something. If someone can overcome these, these limitations, these barriers to, to it uh, actually reaching the target tissue and exerting its effects. Right. Well, what I find interesting about what you just mentioned is that I think a lot of people overlook this, this idea that just because a product is supposed to work, on you know a healthy a healthy individual doesn't mean it's going to work for that specific person right because yeah there's inter individual variances as, as well as uh, over over obstacles to uh to to actually reaching the the uh body where it's supposed to yeah yeah no it's it's good i'm glad you brought that up and and it sounds sounds very interesting i think there's so much out there and i'm glad that you've sort of 
you know, you've, well, you've gotten beyond all of the, that negative publicity. And my hope is that you become known as, as someone who's truly doing the right thing to help people. Because I think on the, on the other side of it, just kind of a full circle moment to the first question I asked you, or one of the first questions I asked you is, you know, what have you done now since all of the, the Balco stuff? And it, it looks like you're, you're, you're doing things above board. You're, you know, you're, you're putting yourself in a, in a situation in which I think you can become the go-to guy for, if nothing else, checking in, Hey, what are the, what, what's, what's valid in this and what's BS in this, you know? Um, and so I think it's nice to have people like you because yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, last two questions and, you know, feel free to, cause this is more of the, the, like the fun side of it. I like to, I like to see when people smile. I mean, we can come on here and we can be very like scientific and we can go very deep, but I also like, I want to know a little bit more about you. And I think the audience appreciates that as well. What are one or two top pet peeves of yours? What are a couple of things that just really get under your skin? And it can be about anything. It doesn't have to be about science and chemistry, but what are some things that just get under your skin? Well, I don't like people with closed minds. I don't like people, uh, that have a, a lot of cognitive biases that immediately hear of a topic and there's nothing you could say to make them look at it otherwise, to make them revisit it. And I just find such people intolerable and not worth my time, you know, because I'm always reevaluating everything, all my beliefs on my belief systems to the extent where I can be a pain in the ass, I guess, in some people. I'm not, I'm not a, I don't take a whole lot of things on faith. Let's put it that way. And I'm very skeptical, but, and I, I figure if there's a God that God wanted us to be that way, God did not want us to just believe everything blindly. He gave us a prefrontal cortex for a good reason. And I think we're here to use that. Now, what is another pet peeve of mm, me? Uh, well I, don't, I don't know. Certain vegetables, <laughs> kale. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. No, no, I like it. I like it. I mean, I listen, I've talked to so many people about that. People who think that juicing kale and, and just eating kale all day long. I'm like, uh, here's some research to show that you might want to reconsider that, you know, or yeah, some of these, some of these, these things that taste really terrible or taste terrible for a reason. <laughs> like pregnant people can't eat them because there's, right. they, they got tox, plant toxins in them. But, but, um, I'm not a, I'm not a yeah. diet person, but uh, I, I do like good food. I don't like food. I think life's too short to kill yourself with disgusting, forcing disgusting things down your body every, for every meal. So. Well said. Well said. Well said. Okay. Well, last question, and it's probably one of my favorite questions because it's I, I love to practice gratitude. So what is something you're most grateful for? Well, I'm most grateful for the people I've met in my life that have given, that have believed in me, that have uh, complimented me and uh, with my abilities that have enabled me to go places, do things that I, I don't think there any, I could have ever done without them. Uh, my old business partner is mm. that way. He was, he came around. He was just like the perfect uh, synergistic compliment to me. Uh, and we were able to get a very successful business, do a lot of amazing things, really amazing things. And he also was patient with me when I wasn't always uh, performing at, at my best. And so a lot of, a lot of gratitude there. Um, certain uh, figures in history or literary figures that I can't, I'm not going to name anyone specifically, but that have inspired me in my readings and, and, and certain scientists that have inspired me with what they've done and their tremendous knowledge and insight into, into things, all things re regarding the universe. Some are quite inspirational indeed. Mm. 
I like where you're headed with that. I, I, I kind of, uh, yeah, I, I, I can appreciate that. So thank you for sharing. What is the best way for people to continue to maybe follow up with what you have going on? I, I know we, we, put in the uh the prototype nutrition but are there, are there some are you on social media like are there good ways for people to to keep in touch with what you're doing i i don't have a i mean i have a presence on, on facebook i don't really post videos or you know that 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 kind of thing I've, I've been doing some podcasts lately you're one of the ones uh in the past few couple of months that i've done i have a blog i guess call it blog. It's basically, I write articles every couple of weeks and they're generally anything of interest in the science, nutrition, health field, various topics, some off the, off the wall topics. I try not to just repeat the same stuff. Everyone else, I try to look for stuff that's a little avant-garde or a little unusual. It, that's people I take a second and say, wait a minute, what is he talking about here? It's not what I'm reading everywhere else. So I try to make it interesting and I put a little bit of effort into it. I just don't talk to chat GPT and let him type the whole damn thing out, you know, <laughs> but I could, <laughs> they, they were people would know it's, it's AI. Not me. Got to yeah, love AI. Yeah. Talk like Patrick Arnold here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, hey, well, we got to I guess, listen, it's it's here. And uh, I don't know if it's going any way anytime soon. But um, I'm glad that you're doing that. Can you maybe mention because we can we can include it into the, the, the show notes. But what is the what is that blog? The site for the blog? It's one word, Patrick, Patrick Arnold blog dot com. It's on this uh, Patreon okay. uh, app. Patrick Arnold blog. Okay. Com. All right. Very cool. Dot com. You got it. So uh, I want to send my sincere gratitude for your time. I know you're a busy man. And um, and look, man, we got through this even despite some uh, Wi-Fi situations. <laughs> yeah. But um, thank you for your time. Also, like the fact that we're both here on the East Coast and you're, you know, this far away. Like, I, I would love to run a few other things by you, especially the f the fact that you have you know, you're renting this lab. Um, you know, I'm doing a lot of cool stuff with electrical muscle stimulation and a few other supplements and things like that as well. So it might be nice to kind of connect on, on that side of things. And then who knows, maybe we come back on and we talk about whatever, whatever else is going on with your new product. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Joshua. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for your time. So this is Josh signing out from Simply Walk the Talk. Until next time. Peace. Simply walk the top. Walk the talk, talking facts Move like me, but I move a little fast Make my move, here to last Fast in these seatbelts, I'm coming past Take care of me, longevity Half my biology, better believe Walking the talk, so mind and body connected Better come give us a listen